Please mark song number 169. Our invitation song this morning is song number 169. Our scripture reader today is Jonah Dad. Today's scripture comes from James chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. I will be reading from the NIV. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Brother Ben. Thank you, Jonah. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning. Good to, I look around, I was going to say good to have our visitors. I don't see that we have. If we do, if you're visiting, we're happy to have you this morning, but... It looks like we're mostly home folks this morning, and it's good to have everybody here. Don't forget, we have a service again this evening at 6 o'clock, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and we would love to have you here for that as well. We're going to start here in just a moment over in the book of Matthew. If you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up over to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. We're going to start over in there in just a second. And uh, I'm not telling anybody anything that they don't know this morning, but we are in a political year, are we not? Just get in your car and drive down the road, you're going to see it because we've got the yard signs all out, we've got advertisements being ran in newspapers, we're seeing them on the television. We're in a political year, the year 2020. We're doing a lot of political things this year. We have uh, a lot of uh, local and county elections, we've got the Democratic primary, the biggest primary for the Democrats coming up on Tuesday, which is Super Tuesday. You can't get past it. We are at a time right now where politics seem to kind of be ruling the day. And we're going to elect, either re-elect or elect a new president towards the end of this year. So it's not like it's going to go away anytime soon. We are in a political year. And a lot of us maybe have already went and voted. Some of us are going to go on Tuesday and vote. Get out and vote if you have not. I want to encourage you to do that. We are going to have a, a political sermon this morning. So, uh, Mark, make sure the door's locked so nobody gets up and runs out on me this morning. <laughs> now, now, it's not going to be the type of political sermon that you might think that we're going to have. We're going to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about what our relationship with politics ought to be and what our relationship with the government ought to be. Because the fact is, we are very fortunate to live in the country that we live in. That every so often we have these seasons that come along where we have the ability as citizens of this country to go and make our voices heard in the voting booth. And what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning is just how do we go about balancing our relationship out with politics, balancing our relationship out with the government, what is our responsibility in our relationship to politics? What is our responsibility in our relationship with the government when it comes to us as Christians? Because if there's one thing that we talk about consistently as Christians is that we really don't belong to this world. This world is not our home. We are here for a very short time. And our residence is somewhere far beyond this. But while we're here, what is it that we ought to be doing? How do we balance out these relationships between politics and the church? How involved should we be? What should we be doing? What should we not be doing? And I want to talk a little bit about this this morning, because this isn't anything new. It's not anything new for people of God to have to try to figure out what should my balance be? How involved should I be? What should I be doing? What should I be giving to Caesar? And what should I be giving to God? And this passage that we're going to look at over here in the book of Matthew is a passage that takes place 2,000 years ago where we have a group of individuals who come to Jesus and their purpose in coming to Jesus and questioning Him is to try to trap Him in His own words. But we get a lesson in relationships to us, 
towards the government and to us towards God. So look with me over here, if you will, over in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to start in the 15th verse, and we're going to uh, read a few verses here, and this is a fantastic passage of Scripture for us to remember all of the time and in political times as well. So Matthew chapter 22, starting in the 15th verse. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed, and so they left him and went away. So in the context of this story, what we've got is we have the Pharisees and the Herodians who are trying to trap Jesus in his own words. They are laying a trap out for him. And one of the little background articles here that you might want to consider is the fact that the Pharisees and the Herodians, they don't like each other. They don't get along with each other very well at all, but guess what? When you've got a common enemy, you can figure out how to make friends with your other enemies, can't you? And the Herodians and the Pharisees both want to get rid of Jesus. And their plan here is, is we will catch him in his words. We will trip him up to where he says the wrong thing so that we can get rid of this guy. We can discredit him by what he says. And their idea is, we will go to him and say, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And their idea is, whatever he says is going to trap him. Because if he says, yes, you need to be paying your taxes to Caesar, then what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, on a religious standpoint, you know what? You're putting Caesar before God. And when you're paying those taxes to Caesar, you're doing like the Romans are doing. You're worshiping him as a god, which would not look good for Jesus. Now, on the other hand, if Jesus comes out and says, no, we serve God only, and we're not going to pay taxes to Caesar, but we worship and serve him alone, then they've got him with Rome. They can say, oh, look at this guy. He is trying to usurp the power in Rome, and he's saying that Caesar isn't in charge, and that you don't have to follow the rules that Caesar lays down. Then we've got him with the Roman government. One of two ways we're going to catch him. And you notice the way that these guys do this. I mean, there is a study in people here on, why, on how they go about trying to trick somebody. They lay it on thick, don't they? They come up to him and, they, and they, they tell him what a great man he is. We know that you're a good man. We know that you're a noble man. We know that we'll get a straight answer from you because this question's really been bothering us. And, and we know that you're not concerned with what men think. You don't put any, any, you know, any weight in that whatsoever. So we know we're going to get a good answer from you on this. You know, so what Jesus says first, oh, you bunch of hypocrites, I know exactly what you're doing. Why do you try to capture me like this? You're trying to trick me up, but I'm going to tell you something. I've got an answer for you. Bring me a denarius, and they bring one out. And he says, whose picture is on that coin? He said, well, Caesar's. Whose inscription's on that coin? Well, Caesar's. Well, then give to Caesar what is Caesar, and give to God what is God's. Now, how are they going to argue with that? And they turn around and they walk away perplexed. They're amazed. Well, he figured out a way to get out of that. Well, he didn't have to figure out a way to get out of that because what Jesus is saying is what Jesus is saying. And it's just truth and it's just fact. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Now, as we go through this life and we live in this country that we live in today, we need to question ourselves sometimes. What is Caesar's? And what is God's? And particularly when we come into a political season like we're in now, because when we come into political seasons in America, what we do is, is we go all in a lot of times. We go all in with the political process, which I'm, tell, I'm, I'm saying we should. We should be involved. As Christians, we should be involved in the political process in this country. We should be casting our votes. We should be doing that. But here's the thing, how do we balance that out? What should our relationship 
to the political process, what should our relationship to the government be in comparison to our relationship to God? Because Jesus lays it out here and says you have a relationship with both of them. You give to the government. What is the government's? You give to God. What is God's? Now here is where I'm going to start this this morning. is with our relationship to Caesar. What is really Caesar's? When I'm talking about Caesar, I'm talking about our government, our relationship, and our responsibilities to the government. What is really Caesar's? What relationship should we really have with Caesar, with the government? Well, you know, the good thing about the Bible is the Bible tells us. Look in your Bibles over to the book of 1 Peter. Look with me over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the second chapter. 1 Peter, the second chapter, starting in the 13th verse. 1 Peter, chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Peter tells us what our relationship with the government should be. Peter writes over in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, and honor the king. Now I want to start with this morning for us to pay particular attention to the 13th verse. Submit yourselves therefore, the, therefore for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether it be the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent to punish those who do wrong, or to command those who do right. Peter says, here's your relationship to the Caesar, to the government, to the king, to the governors. He says, your relationship is this. Submit yourself to every authority that's been put into place. Now, we think about that, and we don't like that. We don't like to think about, well, I need to submit to the government. I need to submit to Caesar. That that's part of my relationship to him, and that belongs to him. I don't like to think about that. Well, I hate to tell you, folks, Peter's not the only one that talks about that. Over in Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul goes into great detail talking about the same thing. Submit yourselves to those in power. Submit yourselves to the governing authorities. Submit yourselves to them and do the things that they tell you to do. He doesn't just say it there. Over in the book of Titus in the third chapter, Paul tells Titus, Submit yourself, therefore, to the governing authorities. So three times in the New Testament, we have instruction that we are to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. Now here's where the question comes in. How much of that submission do we give? How far does that submission go? Because if you notice what Peter says, Peter follows that up by reminding us to be a people who live for God, for it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the talk of them. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants for God. Now here's what I want to point out this morning. We have an allegiance to God. We have a duty to the government. We are called to submit and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. We are called to submit to the government, but we are called to follow God. And we are called to be, have an allegiance to Him. And folks, there's a difference between submitting to and having an allegiance to. Through our allegiance to God, we are ultimately going to be submitting to Him. And we are called on to be a people that submit ourselves to the government. Now, what happens when that government begins to make decisions that go against what God's Word says? Folks, when that happens... Our allegiance is to God. Our relationship with the government is this. We submit to them when they make laws and when they make rules to a point until those rules or those laws cross God's rules and God's laws. I want you to think about the two guys that wrote this. Peter said, submit yourself to the authorities. That's what God wants you to do. Paul wrote, submit yourselves to the authorities, for this is what God's will is for you. Both of those guys were executed by the authorities. 
because they refused to submit to them when the authorities expected them to do things against God's will. God's will is always going to trump whatever Caesar or the government's will is. It's going to trump it every single time. And I want you to think about the fact that those guys went to their death because the government and the leaders of that time had determined that they wanted to shut them down in being the Christians that they were. Peter and Paul both did not say to themselves, well, the government wants to hush me up, Caesar wants to quiet me, the leaders want me to shut up, and therefore, since it's God's will that I submit to them, I will stop doing the things that God expects me to do. Now, when the government tells us that we need to do certain things, we may not agree with it, but if it doesn't go against God's will, folks, we are called to submit to that. You know, there's speed limits all, the way, all over the place I don't like. <laughs> there really are. I go out and drive my car. I get on the highway, you know, I'm, I'm in a 45 mile an hour speed limit. And I'm like, this is dumb. I can go 55 and be safe. I could go 65 and be safe. I, I, can, I can go faster than 45. The government doesn't know what they're talking about by telling me that I have to go 40. But let me tell you something. That is the law of the land. And the government has told me, in this stretch of highway, you're to go 45 miles an hour. And that's not going against God's will. In their way, they're trying to keep me safe and do the right thing and keep other people safe. So the fact is, when it comes to things, I better be submitting to what Caesar tells me to do. But when Caesar pops up and tells me to do something that goes against God's will, my allegiance is to God. Look in your Bibles back to the book of Daniel. Look back to the Old Testament. We're going to look back to the book of Daniel. Now, I understand that this took place long before Peter or Paul, either one, said that we need to submit ourselves to God. But at the same time, the Jewish people understood whenever they were under the rule of a foreign army, a foreign power, or a foreign source, that they had to submit to those people. But at the same time, they understood, ultimately, we will not submit if it means turning our back on God. Now, over in the book of Daniel, look with me to the third chapter, Daniel chapter 3. And we're just going to read starting over in the 16th verse. This is a story that's familiar to many of us that are here today. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three Jewish men who have been literally taken by force into a foreign land by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar has brought the, uh, the Israelites there, and he has put them in labor to him. And he has came up with a rule. I've built a golden idol, and I expect everybody, every time they hear my people start to play music, everybody is to bow down and worship this idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they've been there for a while, and guess what they've been doing? They've been submitting to King Nebuchadnezzar's rules, to a point. When it comes to this, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the land, says, when you hear this music, everybody bows down and worships this idol of gold, guess what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? They say, we're not going to do it. And he says, if you don't, I'll throw you in the furnace and you'll be burned alive. And they said, well, we're still not going to do it. And he gives them chance after chance, and they don't do it. And look over here in Daniel chapter 3, starting in the 16th verse. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing forest, the God we, fire, furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even though if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now you go back through the history of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. These were men that were under a foreign power. And they submitted to that foreign power. They did a lot of things that King Nebuchadnezzar told them to do. As a matter of fact, Daniel rises up to a position of power within that government, a foreign government. But when it came down to it that that government said, you are to turn your back on God, they to a man all stood up and said, we are not going to do it. And you can throw us in the fire, you can arrest us, you can beat us, you can do whatever you want to do, but we will not turn our backs on God. Now, on number one, folks, our relationship to this government is exactly what Peter and Paul said it should be. We submit to this government. We pay our taxes. We follow the laws of the land that have been laid down. 
We are loyal to it to a certain extent, but as Christians, we don't give ourselves up to it when it demands us to do things that go against God's Word. And folks, we live in a day and an age and a time right now where more than at any other point in the history of the United States of America, we are being pushed to give up what we believe as Christians. You remember in 2014, six years ago, the city of Houston? The mayor of Houston in 2014 subpoenaed several big churches in Houston wanting all of their sermons so that they could go through them and determine which ones were hate speech and which ones weren't so that they could shut those churches down. And I loved the response that one of the preachers gave to the mayor and the city council of Houston. He said, I would love to bring y'all every sermon I've preached. Y'all sit in the city council chambers, I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to preach them to you word for word, just like I did from the pulpit. Let me tell you something, folks. When the government starts to tell us what we cannot be as Christians, then that's the time that our allegiance kicks in. In Acts 5.29, when Peter and the apostles were arrested by the leadership of the day, they were taken in, they were jailed, they were beaten, and when they were released, they were told, do not speak in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. You know what the first thing they did was? They walked out of the jail cell, went into the temple courts, and they began to preach Jesus. And they were arrested again, and Peter was dragged before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin said, did we not tell you to stop? preaching in the name of Jesus. And you know what Peter's response was in Acts 5.29? We must obey God rather than men. Folks, that's our number one thing that we need to remember in our relationship with the government. We need to submit to the powers that be. We need to pay our taxes. We need to follow the laws that the government lays down. We need to submit to those authorities and those powers to the point until they cross and expect us to submit to them over God. And do you know why? Because that brings us to the second point. Because we need to remember where the ultimate power is. Do you want to know what a huge percentage of these politicians, especially on the national scale, are all about? It's all about power. It's all about power. How much we can get, how much we can hold on to, and how much we can exert on other people. Now, I want to tell you something about power. You want to talk about power? Who really has the ultimate power? And when we start placing so much faith, and our relationship with our government is in that they are all-powerful and that they can do all things, you know what we've done is we've replaced God. Because God is the only one that's all-powerful. And God is the only one that can do all things. Look with me in your Bibles over the book of Colossians. Look with me back to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, starting in the 15th verse. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Colossae, and he says in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all of creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy." You know who's got the power? Who truly has the power? Jesus Christ and His Father. That is who has the power. And folks, we never, ever need to forget who truly has the power and who it is that we truly answer to. Because when it comes right down to it, you know, people like power. Everybody likes to have power, don't they? Everybody likes to have a little bit of power in some way or another. I remember uh, years ago, And uh, I don't know if she's watching online or not. My wife's not here this morning, so I'm going to tell this. But I can't get away with that anymore, I guess. So years ago, my daughter, she's in junior high, I think. And she gets in trouble. 
And I don't even remember what she got in trouble for. I got to be honest with you, I don't remember. But Mama was mad. And Mama had her sat down. She was sitting on the, on the fireplace hearth. And Brenda was standing in front of her, marching back and forth, just giving it to her. She was just laying it on her. And I don't even remember what she was in trouble for. But I'm sitting on the couch behind Brenda. And Brenda is laying it on Amber. And Amber's probably watching this this morning, too, so I'm going to be in trouble all the way around. So she's, she's laying it on Amber. And Amber at one point does this. <sighs> oh, no. Oh, no. Teenage girl's going to roll her eyes at her mama. You know what Brenda did? She stopped and she looked at her and she said, You roll your eyes at me? I hate doing this since we're broadcasting, but I'm going to do it anyway. This is exactly what she did. You're going to roll your eyes at me? I will take you out. And then she did this. And baby, I can do it. <laughs> exactly like that. Baby, I can do it. I'm behind her and I lost it. <laughs> I started laughing so hard, then Amber started laughing. You want to talk about power? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. There was some power going on in that room that day. I figured out real fast who was really running the show around there. But we love power, don't we? And I'm going to tell you who really has the power. No matter who is sitting in the Oval Office, I can tell you who is sitting on the throne in heaven. I don't care who it is that's in control of us as far as the government goes. I can tell you who is in control of absolutely everything. Jesus Christ and His Father, they have the power. And folks, if we ever forget who really has the power, then our relationship is going to start getting messed up because we're going to start thinking, everything I've got goes to Caesar. Because Caesar has the power. When in reality... God has the power. Do you remember what Jesus told Pontius Pilate when he was standing before him, right before Pontius Pilate sent him to be crucified? Pontius Pilate, the man who is running all of Judea for the Roman government, you don't go any higher in that area until you go to Rome to Caesar. And Pilate has Jesus standing there, and he's trying to figure out every way that he can to get out of this because he, he doesn't really want to crucify Jesus, but he doesn't want to have a riot, and he's in a political mess. Do you remember what it was that Pilate said to Jesus? Because Jesus won't answer him. Talk about submitting to authorities. Pilate's standing there questioning him, and Jesus won't answer because he knows, I'm not submitting to this. It's not part of God's will. And Pilate gets frustrated, and Pilate finally says to Jesus, Do you not know I have the power to set you free? Do you remember what Jesus said? You don't have any power over me. The only power you have is what's been given you from heaven. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The true power is in heaven. I know who's sitting on the throne. I don't care who's sitting in the Oval Well, I do care who's sitting in the Oval Office. But I know who ultimately is sitting on the throne that's not going to be removed. Our relationship with Caesar is we submit to the governing authorities. We give ourselves to them as far as it goes with the civil duties that we do in this life when they do not cross the Word of God. But when they cross the Word of God and we are expected by our government to be less Christian than what we are called to be by our Lord, then at that point our allegiance goes to God because we know where the power is truly at. And then the final thing this morning, folks, is throughout all of this, I'm going to tell you, and this is coming from a recovering political junkie. I am in recovery on this. I used to sit and watch the news 24-7. I had, I had the news channel going in the corner all the time, and I was always mad. I was always upset. I was always irritated. I was always, I was just, err, 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 err. And when I'm always just, er, 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 guess what? I'm not doing the things that God expects me to do. And the third and the final thing for us to remember this morning, folks, when it comes to our relationship with this government, when it comes to our relationship with the political process that goes on, we need to not forget our job. And we need to not forget what our calling is. And we need to not forget what our mission is. 
I want you to look at one last passage with me this morning over in the book of Luke. Turn in your Bibles over to the book of Luke. Luke, the 13th chapter. Luke, the 13th chapter. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 31. Here again, we've got people after Jesus trying to shut him down, trying to get him out of town, and even trying to kill him. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 31. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else, because Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox I will drive out demons and all heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I'll reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jesus Christ had a mission. And that mission was, I am marching to Jerusalem. I am going to the cross. I am doing what my Father instructed me to do. I'm going to give my life for this world. And I am on this mission, and nobody is going to sidetrack me from this mission. And the Pharisees come to him, and they say, You need to get out of town. You need to go somewhere else. Because Herod, the king, the governing authority, wants to kill you. And this is great. Jesus said, I'll go tell that fox, I'm going to do what I came to do. I'm going to heal, and I'm going to preach today. If he wants to come get me, tell him, bring it on. And I'll be here healing and preaching tomorrow. If he wants to get me, tell him, come on. On the third day, I'll arrive at my destination, because I've got a mission, and I know what that mission is. And I know where I'm heading. And at any rate, whatever Herod wants to do, whatever he thinks he can pull, tell him to bring it on because I've got a mission and I'm going to finish that mission and I know what God expects out of that mission. And I'm going to do it. And folks, we're living in this political world today. We live in a country that is more politically divided today than at any other time, I think, since maybe the Civil War. When we can get so entrenched and so involved and so wrapped up that we can forget what our real mission is. That we can forget where our citizenship really is. That we can forget who really is on the throne. That we can forget where the power is really at. Folks, we need to be a people who are politically active. We live in the greatest country in the world. Because our founding fathers came up with this system of government unlike any other in the world where we really have a voice. and We really have an option. We really have a way to go out and let ourselves be heard. And we need to follow as Peter and Paul said. When it comes to it, we need to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. When they make laws, we need to follow them. When they tell us to do things, we need to do it. As long as it is not in conflict with what God has told us. Because we know who the true power is. We know where the true power lays. And we need to remember what our real mission is. Because when it comes right down to it, folks, do you know how long eternity is? I don't. It's forever. I don't know how you even put... I don't even know how you gauge that. If this planet lasts another 5,000 years before the Lord comes back, if we last another 500,000 years before the Lord comes back, in the eye of eternity, that is just a blink. And this little life that we live here is just a mini blink in that. And what we do while we're here is important, but we cannot lose focus of the big picture and what's really, really important. So the question to ask ourselves this morning is, is how much do we give to Caesar? How much do we give to God? Have we given ourselves completely over to God? Because that's, that's where you start today. You know that mission that Jesus was on? That mission that he was talking about right there was, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die on the cross so that these people really have an eternity in front of them. Have you accepted that and taken a hold of that? If you haven't, I want to encourage you to do so this morning. We're going to sing a song of invitation, and the point of that song of invitation is to invite and encourage you this morning. If we can help in any way to bring you closer to God or back to God, we certainly want to be able to do that. If you have not made a commitment to Him the Bible tells us that you do it by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, by confessing His name before man, by repenting of your sins, and by being baptized for the remission of those sins. 
That's what Jesus has told us to do, and He has the power. If you haven't done those things, do them today. Become one of His, because I tell you what, you're going to be a part of a kingdom that's going to go long beyond the United States of America, the world, or anything else. It's going to go on for an eternity. If we can help you this morning, if we can offer baptism, we certainly want to be able to do that. If we can offer prayer, we want to be able to do that. We're going to sing a song of invitation. We want to encourage if we can help in any way to just come to the front while we sing. Let's all stand and sing, please.